after uh, opening our heart uh, in the morning prayer, now we start the first program, which uh, uh, Cardinal John Alai Khan, the Amorite uh, uh, Archbishop of Abuja, who lives in in Nigeria, we welcome him. Uh, he comes from the uh, country where uh, there are economic problems and extremist terrorists frighten uh, people. Kidnappings, massacres are frequent in that country. The religious leaders uh, have an important role and uh, responsibility in in not simplifying the uh, the the present situation into a, a conflict between Muslims and Christians. Uh, Cardinal Oneikan highlights that uh, amongst victims there are Christians and Muslims at the same time, and each. Uh, uh, exploded bomb ha have not only uh, uh, physical, horrible physical impacts on the place, but they poison uh, so society, and it, it they confirm the uh, the image, uh, the fight okay, uh, between Christianity and Islam. It can become fatal, okay, according to the the cardinal. That's why we have to do our best to open the dialogue. Uh, Cardinal Oynakan um, uh, fights for the fulfillment of the freedom of religion. He says that we have to clearly uh, define the relationship between religion and politics, because uh, the experience shows that where religion and politics are mixed or confused, the evil of politics uh, often have an impact on the beauty of religion. We have to focus on the letter to the beauty of religion. Let's listen to the presentation of uh, Cardinal Onaikan, which is about the Eucharist as the summit of our Christian life and the source of all our hope. Receive him with love. Good morning. Ekaro, good morning in my language. Before I go to the text, just two minutes to tell you who I am. With all my excuses to the translators, you have been told already I'm John Cardinal Onayekan, Cardinal Archbishop Emeritus of Abuja the capital of Nigeria. Born 77, 78 years ago, 1944. Became a priest in 1969, and I was ordained a bishop January 1983. Actually, I was ordained at the age of 38, and I have been a bishop for 38 years. So I'm midway between. Pope Benedict made me a cardinal in 2011. I'm from Nigeria. I wish I had time to speak about Nigeria and about what God is doing in our midst, but that is not my ta task for this morning. Just to let you know, though, that Nigeria is a country, a big country, where at least 200 million in population. I hear that I hear that uh, um, this country is only about 10 million or so. These 200 million are split almost 50-50 between Christians and Muslims. And in that case, we are unique in the world, a country where Christians and Muslims are of equal value, equal strength, equal power, and we look at each other in the face without fear. The Catholics are about 20%, but that means we are about 40 million of us in Nigeria. Our relations with Muslims is challenging, exciting, sometimes very complex. All I have to say is that while there are some Muslims who are bent on making every Nigerian Muslim by all means, including violence, there are also many Christians 
who have decided they will be Christians by all means. And we'll try and make every Nigerian a Christian by all means except violence. So the stage is set. We are not afraid. We have hope because the Lord Jesus is reigning on the throne. After this brief introduction, I can go to my text. And I will just follow my text because I don't have the luxury of rambling. The word Eucharist means thanksgiving. We will do well to start on the note of giving thanks to God Almighty for making this Congress in Budapest possible. As you all know, it was supposed to have been held last year, but COVID-19 has pushed it to this year. In everything, even in COVID-19, we must thank God for those who have ears to hear, God certainly has been talking to us through this pandemic. The most important message is that we all belong together. The core of the Eucharistic message is the love of God for all humanity. From this point of view, therefore, there is an eminently Eucharistic component to the global experience of COVID-19. We pray that God will liberate us from the pandemic without too much delay. While we pray for the souls of the many thousands, maybe millions, who have died, may their souls rest in peace. Still on the note of thanksgiving, all of us who are here should thank God that we have been able to be here for this celebration. We cannot forget that there are many people who would have wanted to be here and have been kept away for various reasons, including the restrictions on traveling that are still operating in many places as a result of pandemic, not to talk of the restrictions of pocket money. Those of us who are here, therefore, must thank God because he has called us here to pray for our world with all the problems that the human family is facing today, most of them man-made, but also sometimes natural. Whatever the cause of these problems, we can take the opportunity of the Eucharistic Congress to pray to God to have mercy on his people. Pace Domine, Pace Populo Tuo. Finally, on a more personal note, I really want to thank God and the organizers of this great occasion, especially our friend, my friend, the chief host, the local ordinary of Ostergom Budapest, Cardinal Ede, that I have yet again another opportunity not only to be present at an International Eucharistic Congress, but also to have the honor of being asked to conduct this catechesis. I still remember a similar honor given to me in the last International Eucharistic Congress in Cebu, 2016, in the Philippines. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us. What is my task? <clears throat> Many other people have been given the honor of conducting catechesis at this Congress on various topics about the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. My own task is to share some reflections with you on a particular dimension of the doctrine of the Holy Eucharist according to the theme assigned to me. And this theme is the Eucharist, summit of our Christian life and source of all our hope. Both parts of the theme are interconnected. <coughs> I will draw my reflection from some of the most recent teachings of the church. In particular, I will make good use of three main sources of contemporary church doctrine. First, the compilation of the documents of the Second Vatican Council, which took place in 1962 to 65, about 60 years ago. Many people here were not born when Vatican II ended. I, I went to Rome when Vatican II was about to end in 1965 as a young 21-year-old seminarian. The second is the Catechism of the Catholic Church, published in 1992. 
And the third, <coughs> and the third is the Posynodal Apostolic Exhortation Sacramentum Caritatis of Pope Benedict XVI, published in 2007, as the fruit of the Synod of Bishops on the Holy Eucharist that was celebrated in the year 2005. These documents have put together, summarized very adequately, and updated the ever constant main outlines of the doctrine of the Church on the Holy Eucharist. And to put my reflections in order, I have borrowed the broad outlines of the Apostolic Exhortation Sacramentum Mundi, no, Sacramentum Caritatis. Here, the Holy Eucharist is treated under three dimensions, namely the Eucharist as a mystery to believe, the Eucharist as a mystery to celebrate, and the Eucharist as a mystery to live by. From this three-dimensional approach, I will try to draw out a summary of the teachings that relate to the two points assigned to me. There is another triple dimension that I will keep in mind during this discussion, namely the Eucharist as a real presence, the Eucharist as sacrifice, and the Eucharist as communion. This will be integrated into the, our reflection along with already mentioned triple dimension. Brothers and sisters, this is a catechesis by which I mean I understand a teaching, an instruction session about the doctrine of the church. It is not a theological symposium like the one we just finished in Ostegom last week. Therefore, my language will be largely simple and conversational like I normally speak with my people in Abuja. I will be talking about things that we all already know. This Congress is an opportunity to remind us of what the church has been teaching us from the very beginning. And may the Holy Spirit, which the Lord has sent to us to teach us all things, open our hearts to receive the whole truth about the love of God in the Holy Eucharist. Amen. <clears throat> the Eucharist, the mystery of faith. After consecration, we announce the mystery of faith with the appropriate responses. In its origin, the word sacrament has very close link with the concept of mystery. Thus, the Eucharist as a sacrament is a mystery of faith. It is a sacrament par excellence, the sacrament of all sacraments, the mystery of all mysteries. When we speak of the sacrament of the Eucharist as a mystery, we are stressing the fact that in this sacrament, we see God working in our human existence. This work of God is what the early church called mystery. Mysterium. Modern day usage of the word mystery tends to stress the meaning of mystery as something hidden and not understandable. But sacrament and mystery, even though there is an element of what we cannot understand, that is the mysterious, more importantly, however, we stress the fact that in the Eucharist, the action of God goes beyond our comprehension. His ways are not our ways. We have to keep this in mind in all that we shall be saying in this conversation. Permit me to open this conversation with a very beautiful text from Second Vatican Council, Sacramentum Concil Sac Sacrosanctum Concilium number 47, which gives us a very concise and comprehensive description of the doctrine of the Church on the Holy Eucharist. This was written 60 years ago, but it is still very valid today. And I quote, at the Last Supper, on the night he was betrayed, our Savior instituted the Eucharistic sacrifice of his body and blood. This he did in order to perpetuate the sacrifice of the cross throughout the ages until he should come again. And so to entrust to his beloved spouse, the church, a memorial of his death and resurrection, a sacrament of love, a sign of unity, a bond of charity, a paschal banquet in which Christ is consumed, 
the mind is filled with grace, and a pledge of future glory is given to us. A very powerful statement. I can spend the rest of this lecture just, just talking about this text, but I'm not going to do so. We go now to the three points I decided to make. First, the Eucharist as a mystery to believe. First and foremost, the Eucharist is an object of our faith. We can only get to know anything about the sacrament if we are ready to submit our mind, our will, and our heart to whatever the revelation of God has made known to us about his action of love for us in this sacrament. A significant aspect of this mystery to believe is the fact that in the Eucharist, we have the real presence of God in our midst. Of course, God is always present with us every time and everywhere. Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man, is a physical, visible, historical presence of God in our world. And this is the basis of the real presence of God in Christ, in the Holy Eucharist. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We are also reminded of at least three levels of the real presence of God in the Holy Eucharist. There is the presence of God in the Holy Eucharist in the church because Jesus is the mystical body of Christ, the church. There is the presence of God in the Holy Eucharist in the person of the priest who acts in persona Christi. And finally, the more technical sense, we speak of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharistic material elements of bread and wine. And this is the aspect of the real presence that deserves to be particularly highlighted in this gathering. It all started at the Last Supper when Jesus took bread and broke it and gave to his disciples, saying, This is my body. He did not say, This is a symbol of my body. He said, This is my body. Mark 26, 26. He did the same when he took the chalice filled with wine and said, This is my blood. The church has always derived from this powerful statement of Jesus Christ the doctrine that in the bread and wine that has been consecrated during the Holy Mass, Jesus Christ is fully present in these material elements. Already in the early church, Jesus Christ once stated, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. This statement was found completely impossible to grasp by his audience and by many people even today. But he further stated, for emphasis and for clarity, my flesh is food indeed and my blood is indeed drink. John 6, 51. A profound doctrine difficult to accept. The apostles must have been reminded of these difficult words of Jesus when, at the Last Supper, he said the words to which we have just referred to, namely, this is my body, this is my blood. It is significant <clears throat> that Jesus celebrate this unusual ritual in the context of the Paschal meal of the Jewish faith. He referred to a new and eternal covenant which replaced the Old Testament covenant that was celebrated during the Passover. We note that the Passover meal involved eating the flesh of a lamb that had been sacrificed for the purpose. The new covenant was being established in the body and blood of Jesus, the Son of God, and not in the flesh and blood of an animal. The letter to the Hebrews has a lot to say about this infinitely unequal comparison of how much more excellent the body and blood of Christ is than the sacrifices of the Old Testament which were done with animals, bulls, and goats. Jesus also told his apostles, do this in memory of me. By that statement 
And that command, Jesus gave his apostles the spiritual power to do exactly what he had done. This ritual brings about the real presence of Jesus in the bread and wine that is consecrated on the altar, simply by repeating the word of Jesus, this is my body, this is my blood. The early church do, took this matter very seriously. The Eucharistic ritual had different names, but the most common was the breaking of bread, as we read in many places in the Acts of the Apostles. Because Jesus is truly present in the Eucharistic elements, it is not only to be eaten, but also to be adored. Jesus is eminently present during the celebration of the Holy Eucharist, during the Mass, but the real presence of Jesus does not leave the Eucharistic elements after Mass. For as long as the materials of the elements are there, so also is the whole body and blood of Christ. This is the theological basis for the adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, a holy practice with which we are all very familiar. It is also the reason why we treat the sacred species with great devotion, great care, and great attention. This is the Catholic faith given to us by the grace of God who has freely given this faith as a gift to us. We know that there are some Christians who do not share the full faith in the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist, even though many take seriously the memorial celebration of the Last Supper. It is also the doctrine of the church that only a validly ordained priest can consecrate the Holy Eucharist because only a validly ordained priest can act, act in the person of Christ, in persona Christi. This means that ministers of other Christian denominations whose priestly ordination validity is not acknowledged by our church cannot validly consecrate the Holy Eucharist even if they go, correct, go correctly through all the motions and the rituals. We also know that there are many Christians of other denominations who individually have the faith in the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. But this is more than a matter of your individual personal conviction. It must be the faith of the church. Some have actually decided to live where they are and come home and become Catholics just because of this. And they are always welcome. In this area, we share the same faith with our Orthodox brothers because they have retained the old doctrines of the church from the early fathers and maintained a valid priesthood from the beginning until now. However, unfortunately, disagreements in the course of history between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church for reasons that is not always holy, for a long time negatively affected our sharing in holy communion. We thank God that there has been a recent rapprochement between our two sister churches as a result of the final lifting of the historic mutual excommunication between the Pope and the Patriarch. Can you imagine? He sounds the decross to us today, but it took place. They mutually excommunicated one another with terrible consequences that has lasted centuries. The rapprochement is thanks to the meeting between Pope Paul VI and the Ecumenical Patriarch at Anagoras in 1965, almost 60 years ago, in Jerusalem. From then on, we thank God we are now able to come up to celebrate and share the Holy Eucharist under certain conditions, taking advantage of the faith that we share in the real presence of the Lord Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. But on this point, it should be said that I'm getting mixed up. Let me leave it that way. I only wanted to say that since 1965, by now we should have finished this journey. 
intercommunion between the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church ought to have taken place. We should continue to pray fervently to the Holy Spirit to remove whatever obstacles are still on the way. The real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist has implications not only for us who believe it and celebrate it. What becomes the body and blood of Christ are fruits of the earth and work of human hands. In some way, the entire creation is elevated by the fact that these created objects placed on the altar by the invocation of the Holy Spirit are turned into the body and blood of Christ. Catholic doctrine as a technical word for this process of change from ordinary bread and wine to the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. The, the Council of Trent used the word transubstantiation. This expression this expresses the fact that the substance of the bread has become the substance of the body of Christ, just as <clears throat> the substance of the wine turns into the substance of the blood of Christ. We should note that the presence of Christ is the presence of the whole Jesus, human and divine, and he is fully present in each of the two species of bread and wine. <clears throat> In Nigeria, we will say at this stage, devil, you are a liar. You can't stop me from preaching my catechesis. Now we come to the second point, mystery to celebrate. We are, we are all familiar with the celebration of the Holy Eucharist in the Holy Mass. This has practically become the distinguishing act of our Catholic worship. It is the summit and the apex of our liturgy as it was all clearly taught in the Second Vatican Council on the Church, Lumen Gentium 11. This celebration again goes back to the Last Supper when Jesus shared bread and wine with his disciples. He declared that the bread and wine had become his body and his blood and gave them the command, do this in memory of me. The celebration of the Last Supper itself, as we have noted earlier, is in the context of the Paschal meal of the Israelite faith. The Paschal meal that was a commemoration of what we read about in the book of Exodus at the liberation of the people of Israel from the slavery of Egypt. They had a meal of a lamb that was slaughtered and shared in the family. This became an annual celebration in remembrance of the wonderful deeds of the Almighty God, the God of Israel, passing over the people of Israel during the plague that destroyed the firstborn of the Egyptians. The Passover festival was the most important religious celebration of ancient Israel. At the Last Supper, Jesus moved from the Passover meal of the Old Testament to the Eucharist of the new and eternal covenant. From the Paschal Lamb to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There is thus a movement from the old covenant established on Mount Sinai to the New Testament in the blood of Christ on Mount Calvary. We also know that the Eucharistic table of the Last Supper was a preparation for what happened later on the cross of Calvary. This is why the Eucharist is not only a meal, but also the memorial of the sacrifice of Christ that far outweighs the sacrifice of the Lamb of the Old Testament. The celebration of the Eucharist, therefore, brings us to the Paschal mystery, the mystery of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ for our redemption with the forgiveness of our sins. St. Paul was very clear about this in his epistle to the Corinthians when speaking about the Eucharist. As often as we celebrate the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the blood of Christ, we are celebrating the redemptive act of Christ until he comes again. The church takes very seriously the actual celebration of the mystery of the Eucharist. It is the apex of the liturgical worship of the church. <clears throat> the form of the core of the celebration has remained the same from the beginning, everywhere down through the ages until now. 
It is the same celebration in its major elements, even though with the passage of time and with the expansion of the Christian community to different cultures, it has taken different forms. We note the introductory greeting of our dear Cardinal Eder at the beginning of the beautiful Byzantine mice that we all, many of us participated in yesterday in the Cathedral of St. Stephen. Thus, although we now have the celebration of the Eucharist according to a variety of rites, nevertheless, the core of the Eucharist remains the same. By the same token, even today, while maintaining the core of the Eucharistic celebration, the church encourages the adaptation of the celebration according to the diversities of cultures and time. Thus, the Eucharistic celebration has become a very important object of the much talked about inculturation of the liturgy, especially in churches like our own in the missions. But we should not forget that whatever we do with inculturation, it should not be simply or primarily to promote our culture, even though this is also very important. Rather, the primary objective of inculturation is to ensure that the core of the message and the meaning of the Eucharist can be brought home more clearly to the people of different cultures and times. The first visible aspect of the inculturation of the liturgy was precisely the language of the liturgy. Catholics of my generation will still remember the change from mass in Latin, yes, Latin, even in Nigeria, to mass in the vernacular. And the great impact it made because people were able to understand the liturgy better when it was celebrated in their own language. The celebration of the Eucharist is the reenactment of what Jesus carried out at the Last Supper. When we gather around the table of the Eucharistic celebration, it is Jesus that is celebrating the Eucharist. The priest is a human minister who celebrates in the person of Christ, provided he is validly ordained and properly commissioned to do so. But beyond the priest, the entire congregation also joins in celebrating the Eucharist, since the Eucharist is celebrated by the whole Christ, both the head and, in mem and his members. This is why Second Vatican Council insists on the active participation of all those who are present at Mass. We do not go to Mass to watch a show as spectators. We go to Mass to participate in a sacred action in which the Eucharistic meal of Jesus at the Last Supper is reenacted fully and completely. There are, of course, many kinds of celebrations of the Eucharist. Some are very simple, while others can be quite elaborate, like the one we saw yesterday. Some are celebrated with a few people, while others are with large crowds, like which I have very soon here. We have also cases of special occasions, like the, for example, during Eucharistic Congress or other similar occasions. Whatever the situation, the Eucharist is always the same. None is greater than the other. Similarly, it doesn't matter who is the minister, whether he is a pope, a bishop, or a newly ordained priest, it is Jesus that is celebrating. We should therefore beware of allowing any kind of discrimination among priests as ministers of the Eucharist. In some parts of the world, like where I come from, we once in a while hear about some priests who claim or are claimed to have special powers and whose holy mass is considered more powerful than others, not without some pecuniary implications for the devout but gullible faithful. All of this has nothing to do with our Catholic faith. Every holy mass has infinite value before God. This is why, indeed, whoever is saying mass must observe the same ritual, especially in its core elements of the Eucharistic prayer. The Catholic liturgy has no room for extravagant theatricals and creative performance, often bordering on vulgar entertainment, not worthy of Christian worship. Please note that when we say, when we can celebrate, when it comes to the very core of the Eucharist, the time for the consecration, all of us remove our 
Suketo. Even the Pope removes his Suketo. And you just see priests celebrating. At that point, we are all just priests. For me, that gesture is very important. And the people of God should not miss it. When the, Reverend, when the bishop removes his Suketo during Mass, it's not just for as if it's, it's, it's part of the It has a meaning. The celebration of the Holy Eucharist is in two parts, the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the sacrament, both of which form one single liturgical celebration. Dei Verbum, the Vatican document on the divine revelation, stresses uh, the unity of both parts. It teaches that the Eucharistic altar is one table, one table of the word of God and the body of Christ, both of which are spiritual nourishment for the faithful who participate at the Eucharistic celebration. Dei Verbum 21. The reading of the scripture, therefore, during Eucharistic celebration is already the presence of God himself in his saving word, feeding us for life eternal. Finally, the third point, the Eucharist, the mystery to live by. In the Holy Eucharist, we have an intimate union with Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Father, of God the Father, through the action of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we have an intimate union with the Holy Trinity. Through the Holy Eucharist, God not only comes to us, but God lives in us and we in him. That is why St. Paul was able to declare, I now live not I, but Christ who lives in me, Galatians 2, 20. If through the Holy Eucharist we attain this deep, intimate union with Christ, then it follows that whatever we do, we do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is thus the summit of our Christian life. We are in God, not only as individuals, but also as community. God is in the community, and the community is with God. This intimate union between us and God is affected especially by Holy Communion, the reception of the body and blood of Jesus under the forms of bread and wine. Normally, and I repeat, normally, the reception of Holy Communion is essential for full participation in the liturgy of the Holy Eucharist. Emphasis on full. Where we participate in the Holy Eucharist, we should also receive the Holy Communion. Not to do so would be like attending a banquet without eating or drinking anything. However, however, this is not without condition, which we should always know very well. It is usually said that we go to communion if we are in a state of grace. But before that, we must also be a full member of the Catholic Church, baptized and normally also confirmed. St. Paul already warned us not to eat and drink the Eucharist unworthily, because to do so would be to eat damnation unto ourselves. That warning should be taken very seriously. That is why we begin the celebration of Mass with a penitential rite in which we are given some little time to examine our conscience and then pray earnestly for forgiveness of our sins. Similarly, at the actual time of receiving communion, the sacred host is shown to us with the words, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. To this solemn announcement, we reply, O oh God, I am not worthy that you should enter into my roof, but only say the word and I shall be healed. From this, we can say first and foremost that strictly speaking, nobody is worthy to receive the Holy Communion. We are all sinners before God. That is why when at the beginning of Mass, we recite the confit here, I confess to Almighty God, we must do it sincerely. It is not just a formality. So also when we say before communion, oh Lord, I'm not worthy, we must say it sincerely because we are really not worthy. 
St. John told us, if we say we have no sin, we are lying and deceiving ourselves. Rather, we should thank God for admitting us into a union with himself, making us worthy to celebrate the Eucharist with him through his mercy. It is part of Catholic doctrine that actually the Holy Eucharist is also medicinal as it cleanses us of venial sins and also protects us against serious mortal sins. Having said that, it is still the doctrine of the church that anyone who knows himself or herself to be in a state of serious sin which distances him from the love of God should not move forward to receive Holy Communion simply because everybody is going. He must first avail himself of the sacrament of reconciliation with God through confession. And I con we congratulate the organizers of this, meet of this Congress who are always reminding us of the possibilities for confession. And we thank the Reverend Fathers who also make themselves available for confession. The doctrine of the church on this has not changed. But unfortunately, what we see is a general stream of people going for communion at mass, and it seems that they don't really bother whether they are in the right spiritual state to receive it. It is the duty of pastors to remind the faithful about this without introducing unnecessary exaggerations in the matter. It is also the duty of pastors to make access to confession easily available for the faithful. It is true that only God knows who is in a state of sin and who is in a state of grace. However, since the reception of Holy Communion is also an external act of the church, it is within the competence of the church to put down laws and rules to regulate who, because of their external disposition, should not be admitted to the Holy Eucharist. This is why we have situations where people are simply told, don't come for communion until you have changed your status. Such admonition is best done in the general catechesis of the faithful so that those who know themselves to be in irregular situation will regulate their behavior without waiting to be publicly pulled out of the communion rails. In our place, where I come from, whenever we have a big gathering like this, when non catholics and non-Christians are there, before communion, we go and make announcement to, if you are not a Catholic, please don't come and receive communion. The, 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 the value, the blessings of the Holy Mass is for all of us, and anybody will get that blessing. But for Holy Communion, it is reserved for only Catholics who are prepared themselves for it. We make that announcement as politely as we can without, uh, without causing any problem with anybody. The most common instance of irregularity is maritas with regard to mar marriage status. Considered by church law as irregular and therefore should keep away from holy communion are for example, those who are living together in open or even secret concubinage without the sacrament of matrimony, and those who have married, divorced, and remarried without going through the process of canonical annulment. All such people, even though they may feel in their heart of hearts that they are at peace with God, are not supposed to come for communion. The apostolic exhortation of Pope Francis Amoris Laetitia has very wonderful things to say about such circumstances. While recognizing the fact that only God judges the heart, he still insists that there are some objective situations over which the church can and must pass judgment and make rules and regulations. Otherwise, it will mean that anybody who wants can come forward and receive Holy Communion. This will be utter disorder that cannot be allowed in the church of God. Corinthians 1, 14, 32 to 33. But we should realize that it is not only matters of irregular marriage that can make a Catholic not fit to receive communion. Anybody who is in a stable, immoral way of life should decide to keep away until he or she can change their situation. 
Here, we can cite as example those who are making a living by immoral means. For as long as they are making a living in this way, they must keep away from communion until they have the grace to change their way of life. A recent situation that has generated a lot of discussion has to do with the responsibility of Catholic politicians to uphold the laws of the church in their political choices and decisions, especially with regard to serious sin of abortion. Unfortunately, serious though the sin of abortion is, it has become generally legalized and considered as normal in many places, especially in the so-called developed nations many of which also claim to be Christians, even Catholic. But nevertheless, the position of the Catholic Church resolutely insisting that abortion is the killing of innocent unborn children continues to hold. Any Catholic who commits abortion or who cooperates in the committing of abortion should know that he has committed murder and should keep away from Holy Communion unless and until he has gone for confession. It's not so difficult to get back to God even after doing such a thing. The problem is when people are proud of what they have done. That is what the moral law says. But like everything moral, there's always the area of personal responsibility. Sometimes people have found themselves in a situation of abortion in a way that it may not be their fault. In fact, they can even be victims of circumstances. God will judge that. While the church will take note of such circumstances, we cannot keep making exceptions for the general moral law. More delicate and problematic is whether a Catholic politician must always necessarily vote against any law that is permitting abortion or immoral action. The important issue here is that very often, once it comes into the arena of party politics, it is necessary that the church be careful not to drag the Holy Eucharist into political wrangling, lest more damage is done than we try to avoid. The basic problem is that while we hold strongly to our moral principles, we live in a world where there are others who do not share those principles. Provided nobody forces us to go against our moral principles, we may at times be forced to take note of the fact that others see things differently. In these matters, our experience in a country like Nigeria, where we live with Muslims who are insisting on the Sharia law, has taught us the useful lesson on how not to impose the religious laws of a faith community in a multi-religious nation. As a bishop, I've tried my best to encourage my Catholic politicians to always stand out clearly and oppose any law that is against the law of God, because it cannot be for the good of the people if it's against the law of God. The law of God, according to Catholic doctrine, is valid for everybody, not only for Catholics. St. Paul has made clear reference to this when he speaks of the law of God in the heart of every person. It is the duty of the Catholic politician to do his best to uphold good moral principles, even in the public domain. If for political reasons he is unable to stop an immoral law, he should at least be on record as having opposed it. There is a debate going on in some countries whether a politician who, for political reasons, votes for an immoral law should be stopped from Holy Communion. If voting for an immoral law, even in a secular state, amounts to becoming an accomplice to the crime, then we will be dealing with a moral decision that is incompatible with receiving Holy Communion. But from a pastoral point of view, it is not so clear whether if such a person actually presents himself at the altar rails for communion, we should publicly refuse to give him communion, thereby causing a major uproar and scandal. Both St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas proposed caution. They proposed caution, caution in handling such cases, caution that not, does not touch the principles. I believe that it should also be said that a Catholic politician who disagrees 
publicly with his church on a moral issue should do well to avoid deliberately provoking controversy around the Holy Eucharist. He has the duty to abide by the rules of the church on matters of church rules and regulations. Therefore, <clears throat> The bottom line is this. We should check ourselves before we go for communion. Otherwise, instead of receiving Jesus in our hearts, we may eat damnation unto ourselves. This has to be preached in season and out of season. Whatever our condition, there is always a way back to repentance. This, in fact, is one of the great merits of the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. When a Catholic is anxious, to be a regular communicant. He will try his best to put himself in a situation where he can worthily and properly receive it. It does not mean that we will never go astray, but it means that whenever we go astray, we will find our way back as soon as possible through the sacrament of reconciliation in confession. I'm seeing that my time is going, two minutes more. We have, there's question of communion, Communion means we go together, we, eat this, we take the same bread, we take the same cup. That means we are sharing the heavenly bread. If we can share the heavenly bread, surely we should be ready to share the material earthly bread so that our receiving communion really is a, a challenge for us to be interested in feeding the hungry in our midst. <clears throat> Taking of communion and the importance of it in our life, we cannot forget that those of us who are actually receiving Holy Communion, compared to the population of humanity, we are still a very small minority. We should therefore not forget to think of the following categories of people who cannot receive communion for various reasons. The Catholics who can receive communion because there are no priests to celebrate the Eucharist. In remote villages, we meet that regularly. The Catholics who cannot receive communion because of the reasons we have already mentioned. Read Amoris Letizia of Pope Francis, and we have very useful indication there. Sometimes there are many Catholics who, go, who, who take the trouble to go to Mass but are not too interested in receiving communion. We should tell them, put yourself in good order. Now, we must also think of those who just cannot receive communion because they are not Christians, or even if they are Christians, they are not Catholics. And here, we are talking of billions of people in the world who are not Christians, who simply have no idea of Eucharist and are not interested in it. I believe that, <clears throat> I believe that we should not forget these people when we walk up to the altar and receive the great gift of the Holy Eucharist. We must know that this demands that we pray for all men and women. After all, the blood of Christ was shed for us, and we are told, for many, even some translation says, for all. Therefore, our participation in the Holy Eucharist must make us constantly think about the whole world and for everybody. It is the source of our hope. It is the summit of our faith. My time is come. I see red zero, zero, zero on the monitor, which means my time is up. I want to thank you very much for your patience, and may God continue to bless us in the Holy Eucharist. Amen. <clears throat>